Rest may be more because it is difficult to prove than that you want to know, that you actually want to do it all the time. But there is a better theorem, and that is actually the one that we will concentrate on, and that is what I call uh, theorem three. And that theorem reads as follows. So theorem three, there is again, well, let me just call it for the moment PTA, polynomial time algorithm, just to abbreviate that uh, on input, K, T, and the alphas as before. And then what it does is that it does not decide whether one particular vector gives me a relation. No, it just writes down all relations, determines a Z basis for the group of multiplicative relations and the group of multiplic multiplicative relations between the alpha i is defined as the kernel of a certain group homomorphism from the additive group z to the t to the multiplicative group of k and it does exactly what you expect given such an integer vector it evaluates the corresponding power product of the alpha i. So that is a group homomorphism from an additive group to a multiplicative group. Its kernel will be a subgroup of z to the t, the group of all of these. Uh, vectors and it will consist exactly of all vectors satisfying this relation from the previous theorem. And it is well known from elementary algebra that every subgroup of z to the t will itself have a z basis. It will be isomorphic to z to the, let's say, u, where u is an integer, non-negative integer that is at most t. And this is a theorem that you can think of as the discrete well, a solution to the discrete logarithm problem for the group K star. The discrete logarithm problem is traditionally formulated for a finite cyclic group for which you give two elements, one element being a generator, and the question is to write down the second generator as a power of the first. So you can reformulate that by saying that given these two elements, you want to know all relations between them, which in a sense is a better problem because your second element may not be a power of the first at all, but the relations, that is a well-defined question. So this is a problem that is being solved by this theorem that may be viewed as the most sensible extension of this discrete logarithm problem to other multiplicative groups. And you may know that when you take for k large finite fields, then in many situations this discrete logarithm problem is considered to be very difficult. So difficult, in fact, that people are basing crypto systems on that problem. And 
then, well, if this theorem number three has any tangible applications, then one of them may be of a negative nature in the sense of discouraging people to base crypto systems on discrete logarithms in the multiplicative group of a number field. But I certainly do not exclude that there are also more positive applications. And in fact, one of the most striking applications of number fields in computational number theory is the number field sieve for factoring integers. And in the number field sieve, several things are happening that are sort of reminiscent of what is occurring in this theorem three. Maybe I will come back to this analogy, if it is one, later in the week. Any questions? Okay. Oh, there's a question. Do you have to worry that the, uh, the coordinates of the factor in the kernel get very large? No, no, no. Uh, so, yeah, right. So that is a very good point. So your question is, is maybe uh, the, 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 are the entries of such a basis maybe too large to write down? Well, it follows from this theorem that they aren't. Uh, but it is clear that uh, at one point you will need to prove that. I'm not saying that every z-basis is short, but it will compute a short z-basis. Yeah, that is a good point, and actually that is a point that I will also come back to when I discuss the other thing that I thought about last year. And that has to do with computations with finitely generated abelian groups like this z to the t. This k star is not finitely generated, but the subgroup, well, the image of this map clearly is. And the relevance of algorithms for finite abelian groups is already clear when you want to see why this theorem number three is actually a better theorem than theorem two. And by this I mean that there is a quick way of using this algorithm for proving this algorithm, proving that you have an algorithm like in theorem two. Namely, if you start with your alpha i, you first find this basis, that is the output of this algorithm, and then you have to decide whether this vector is a z-linear combination of the basis vectors that you found here. So there you have to, you have the problem that you have an H, a subgroup in z to the t, which is specified by writing down t and writing down a basis for H. You are given an element here, that is the element from theorem one, and you have to verify you have to test whether the element belongs to the subgroup. That is a typical problem, a typical algorithmic problem on finitely generated abelian groups that you encounter. And there are really many problems of that nature that we will need and use in the course of this course. And I am therefore very happy that I talked about how to do these things already last year and that I don't have to repeat them. And you can read about them in the notes that Dan wrote. And what I will do now is just restrict to a few basics so that you know what the sort of game is that people are playing here.
So this is about algorithms for finally, FG means finally generated abelian groups. And these abelian groups are always going to be specified to our algorithms. Let's call such a finally generated abelian group, call it A. It will always be specified by generators and relations. And that is already a restriction, as I will mention in a moment. But what does this mean? Well, generators, that means if you have, for example, n generators, that is the same as saying that you have a subjective group homomorphism from z to the n to a. And subjective, that means that this sequence is exact. But those generators, well, they will typically be dependent. So you have to also say what the relations are, and if there are m relations, each relation being a vector in the kernel, then the ith relation will be the image of the ith basis vector here, and that will give rise to a group homomorphism. And this A will then be the co-kernel of this group homomorphism alpha. And this alpha is given by an n times n, n times m matrix over z, where the ith column is the image of the ith basis vector in z to the n. So in other words, Representing a finitely generated abelian group by means of generators and relations is equivalent to realizing it as the co kernel of a matrix. And the matrix, this matrix, will be the matrix that specifies the A. So the input will be a matrix, and then you use it for specifying A, the elements of A will then be represented by multiple linear combinations of the generators, so by an element of Z to the N mapping to it. There are clearly other ways of representing finite degenerated abelian groups and the problem of going back and forth between different representations. Those are exactly the, among the algorithmic problems that one has to face. But before I tell you what those problems are, let me also tell you how you represent group homomorphisms. If I have two groups that are given, and I want to have a group homomorphism here, then it is very easy to show that it can be lifted to a group homomorphism here, which is again given by a matrix. So homomorphisms between abelian groups specify they are specified by telling what happens to the generators. So those are again given by matrices. But of course you have already a problem here because not every group homomorphism here will factor through a commutative diagram like here. There is a condition uh, and the condition is, and which is necessary and sufficient, that the image of the map from Z to the M to Z to the N prime actually lies in the image of z to the m prime. So in other words, you also need to know that there is a map like that. And that already gives rise to the first algorithmic problem. And that is decide whether a given matrix actually defines a homomorphism from A to A prime. And this is something, look at the notes, that can be done in polynomial time. 
And then there are other questions that you can ask. For example, in addition to representing homomorphisms, you want to represent subgroups. But subgroups, they are just a special case of homomorphisms. You can think of them as injective homomorphisms. And that gives rise to the question, OK, if I have such an arrow that gives rise to a uniquely defined arrow here, is that second arrow injective? Is that second arrow surjective? Is maybe that second arrow an isomorphism? Does there exist an isomorphism at all? And there are many of these problems, and uh, let me just tell you the rule of thumb by which you decide whether, though, whether a given problem is solvable in polynomial time. Well, one way of doing it, of course, is check whether it occurs in the list of Dan, although I am not claiming that it is complete. But the general rules are that you should not ask something unreasonable. So the first thing is do not ask for large output. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I am given A and B, two abelian groups, then you see, for example, that you can, pute, you can compute a homomorphism group. But typically, that is a bit larger. You can also compute the tensor product. But for example, if you want to compute high tensor powers, well, according to the rules of the game, as I define them, these tensor powers will just take up an amount of space that is not going to be logarithmic in N. So the the, the output will typically not be bounded by a polynomial in the length. So that is something that you should avoid. And then the second is do not ask for prime factorization because you are supposed to know that you cannot do it until, of course, as I mentioned, someone else pr does it for you in the future. So what do I mean by this? Well, I mean two things by them. So here's an obvious problem. If I have A, an abelian group, then you can uniquely write it as a direct sum of cyclic groups where all the di, well, they may be zero and they may be integers at least two. This t is at least zero and you can make this unique, for example, by requiring that d1 divides d2 and that each of them divides the next one, except for the last one. So each is a multiple of the preceding one. So the zeros appear at the end. And given A, this sequence of numbers is unique. What is not unique? in general is the isomorphism but this can for example be used to decide whether two given finally degenerated abelian groups and given I mean that they are the input to your algorithm whether two given finally generated abelian groups are isomorphic or not simply apply the algorithm from the nodes that computes your d's and then you will compare the d's for two different groups and if the whole vector is the same well that occurs if and only if the groups are isomorphic but there is a different way of making the di unique and that is by requiring that they are let's say uh, when they are not zero well they are maybe a non-increasing set of powers of prime numbers for example if a is itself z mod nz then you, the di's they are the prime powers that 
exactly divide n and that is just something that you don't that you will not be able to find so don't ask for anything in which the word prime occurs that is wise in order to avoid super polynomial algorithms and there are also boundary cases where maybe the word prime does not occur but that are sort of inconceivable to answer without having a written with prime powers for example finding how many automorphisms a has how many automorphisms finding the number of automorphisms uh, on input a that is virtually impossible. In fact, there is a not so difficult probabilistic polynomial time algorithm that given uh, the number of automorphisms of a cyclic group Z mod NZ writes down the complete prime factorization of N. Probabilistic algorithm that runs in expected polynomial time. And well, if you look at the expressions for this number of automorphisms, then you see that the prime power description very strongly occurs in it. On the other hand, there seem to be related things that you can do. For example, I wrote down the homomorphisms. If you take a equal to b, then you can compute the set of endomorphisms of A, and that is as an abelian group just hom A comma A, but because A is equal to B here, this is not just a group, it is also a ring, it's a finite ring if A is a finite abelian group, and you can compute it as a ring, you can write down just as I did with the Cijk for the number fields, you can write down the multiplication, if I call this E, then the multiplication is simply a group homomorphism from E times E to E, and you can compute all of that, and this group is the unit group of this E. So that just goes to show that if you are given as input, for example, a finite ring, which need not be commutative, but even in the commutative case, do not ask for the unit group of such a finite ring, do not ask for the prime ideals of such a finite ring if it is commutative. So there are certain things that one should avoid. But the rule of thumb appears to be that if you avoid necessarily large output and if you avoid prime factorization, then typically a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for your problem will exist. There are certain intermediate cases. For example, I was talking about high tensor powers here. If you look at high exterior powers, you run into the problem if this A is, for example, free over Z of determining the determinant of an endomorphism. And that is sort of an intermediate situation because, uh, well, there is still enough room to write down everything, but you really have to avoid in the computation of determinants the phenomenon of coefficient blow up. Let me say a little bit more about that in a second. Any questions so far? Okay. Yeah, coefficient blow up. So there is one way in which these algorithms for finally degenerated abelian groups form a somewhat dry subject, and that is because if you look up a typical textbook where the basic properties of finite abelian, finally generated abelian groups are treated